Okay, well, I guess we'll just let everyone else trickle in. The last, if we go by the usual attrition rate, we'll have another 10, 15 people over the evening. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for coming, guys. I have no idea how this is all going to go down because I finished these slides about two minutes before I drove over here. Um, and I, you know, so I, but I got plenty of code we can do and I can add more code. I'm um, not sure how long this will take, but we'll go by, you know, whatever your interests are. Um, so the goal of tonight is to just give you an idea of the core mechanisms behind virtual machines. You know, Java has a virtual machine, uh, Python, Ruby, a lot of these fun, you know, languages that you're using. Um, and JavaScript ultimately, or originally was uh, purely an interpreted language. Um, <clears throat> this will give you an idea of how all these things are built. Yeah, maybe we can close that. And despite being really, really simple, the virtual machine I'm showing you tonight is actually modulo efficiency, exactly what I built the first time I built a commercial interpreter 25 years ago. I built a, a machine very simple or similar to what we have here tonight that was building cars in France, you know, with these robot controllers for many years. So, word to the wise, don't buy a Renault car from like 1989 and 93. Um, I guess there's no danger of that now. Uh, okay. So feel free to ask questions, interrupt, send me on a tangent, whatever. Um, so I'm kind of not going to assume, you know, anything except programming uh, as we go through here. So. Bear with me if, if you happen to be an expert in this. So our goal of the virtual machine, and by virtual machine, I don't mean something that you can spool up at Amazon to create a new like Linux box, right? This is a virtual machine that is really a simulation of uh, a simple computer that we use to execute code. So why do we want one of these things? Well, obviously, if I'm trying to implement a programming language, um, Java the first time or any other language, I've got to be able to execute it somehow, right? A computer does not inherently understand Java or C or Python or anything. So we have to have some way to get that high level language down into something the computer understands. Now a traditional compiler will take that high level language, do some really fancy stuff and generate really low level machine code, which are instructions specifically for the processor that the computer has on its motherboard. That is how you're going to get the most efficient, well, uh, I, uh, for the researchers, yes, we'll say it's the most efficient, but obviously an on-the-fly compiler can do a little better sometimes. But the basic idea is why don't we always go to machine code if it's so efficient? Well, it's a lot harder to generate byte or machine codes than byte codes. Byte codes are a little bit higher level. They're somewhere between machine code and source code. So the other thing is that's portable. So if I define this imaginary machine, like a Java machine or whatever, then I can implement one of those on any machine I want. For example, the Dalvik VM running on your Android phone. Who has an Android phone? Ugh, I spit on you. <laughs> I just sold mine. I had an iPhone. I'm like, oh, this is driving me crazy. I spent 750 on an S5. Then I spent 750 on a 5S 30 days later. Um, yeah, that just happened to me. So, but you got the Dalvik VM running Java. That's a Java machine, right? It implemented an interpreter, albeit a different one, but it implements a bytecode interpreter virtual machine that will execute instructions that are in between machine code and a high-level language. So now, of course, the real trick is, as I just alluded to, is that for real performance, then, you have these virtual machines like Java and the Dalvik VM that will take these bytecode instructions and actually translate those down into machine code as it executes them, and then it will really be running native code. So uh, in the end, these machines, like the JavaScript VM is really fast. Google's VM is really fast. It can, it, because it's translating these bytecodes to machine code uh, ultimately on the fly. How many people uh, built Java code back when Java didn't have a compiler? It was just interpreted. Oh, you youngsters. OK, one guy old guy. Um, it was really slow, <laughs> really slow. Uh, but you didn't have a compiler or you didn't have a JIT? didn't have a JIT. Yeah. yeah, that's the problem. The new, <laughs> since we all have on-the-fly compilers now, it's hard to say, well, what exactly is the compiler? Uh, well, there's two of them. Okay, <clears throat> so, uh, so our goal is to simulate some kind of little tiny computer. 
And if you look up, you know, sort of in an engineering, uh, computer engineering style book, you'll see things that look like this. And anybody recognize the assembly code on the right? Which processor? I'll give you a hint, it's an 8-bit processor. That cuts out most of you, I guess. Damn it, am I really that old? 6502. Yeah, it's 6502, that was in the original Apple. Uh, so these are, these are these simple little instructions, like this incremented a particular memory location. So this is what we call assembly code. So this is for humans, right? But this is what the machine actually executes. So at address 600, this happens to be hex, I think, yeah. At some particular address in the code memory, um, there are some machine instructions that are encoded in all these little bits here that we as humans interpret as this. Of course, uh, what we really understand is something that looks like that in a high-level language, but so the goal of a bytecode compiler is to take something that's, well, actually higher level than this, but generate this, something like that, and then we'll have a virtual machine instead of a real machine execute this. But the, the terminology you'll hear is fetch, decode, execute. And so built within this processor, there's something that asks for the next instruction to execute, and then it figures out what it is, because, you know, what the hell is A for? Well, it's a bit pattern, and pieces of that bit pattern tell it what to do. So it decodes it, and then it'll play around executing it by messing with registers or the uh, arithmetic logic unit, and then maybe writing stuff back to memory, things like that. So but that's pretty gross and hard to understand. So we're going to do something higher level. Because obviously that would be hard to generate. So we're, we're going to have fewer instructions, but they're going to be very regular. Machine code especially if you work in the Intel world, they're like, oh, this instruction only works with these registers, and it's a big mess. Imagine, uh, you know, if in your programming language, you can only use plus if your variable starts with Q. I mean, it's, it's insane, but those are the limits of hardware. Now, since I'm not constrained by hardware, I can invent a very nice regular instruction set. So, um, let's say I have a high-level programming language that wants to say this, print one plus two assuming the compiler doesn't do uh, optimization and convert that to a three, we're going to actually translate, well, a compiler that generates bytecodes would translate down to this, which says integer constant one, push it on the stack. Integer constant two, push it on the stack. Integer add, that's gonna take the two top operands off the top of the stack, so pop, pop, add the result, and then push it back on. And we'll see this in more detail later. So how many people have used uh, one of the old HP calculators that was uh, reverse Polish notation, right? You'd go like one, two, plus, and you get the result. Um, that's what this is. It's a stack machine just like that. So now, if we actually, this is a trace from the actual code that I built. This is address zero. These are all in decimal, though. Address zero, the instruction is integer constant, and then the operand is one. And you'll see that after it executes, it's pushed one on the stack. And for this display, the stack grows to the right. Uh, so then I push a two on there, of course, and then the result of adding integer add is gonna be three. And then when I do a print, that pops the value off and then dumps it to standard out, and then halt just stops the execution of the program. Um, why? Do you think I have the I constant instead of just const and I add instead of just add? Because then I have to have like F for float, like F add, F const, all this. Why do I do that? Any ideas? Because the, the processor will care. Ultimately, the processor does care. Um, and basically, the less each of these instructions has to think, the faster it's going to be. Imagine a plain add instruction. The add instruction, if I tell it the operands are integers, it can just grab them and go <laughs> slap them together. But if it has to first say, are you a float? Is the other one a float? Is it a float and an integer? Is it an integer and a float? Well, you know. So it has to do the conversion, has to think. Anytime it has to think, it's gonna slow down. And so what we do is we make the compiler smarter, and it realizes, ah, oh, that one is an integer, and that two is an integer. So I will generate integer instructions, okay? So that's assuming, of course, the language has static types like Java. Python would have to have a generic instruction like add, 
And then in runtime, it would have to figure out what those operands are. So that's another reason that often dynamically typed languages are going to be slower. OK. Um, so any questions on the basic execution of this little bit of bytecode? code? Yeah? Um, what are the numbers that in the trace? Is that memory address? Uh, this is code address. Code address. So I, why yeah. do you have this jumps by two at first and then only jumps by one? Is that the ah. two? Yes, it is the operand. Okay. So as we'll see later, this each instruction is going to uh, require a word. Okay. And then each operand is a word. Now normally it would be a byte. And then your operands would be like 16 bits or 32 bits for efficiency, right? Because you want to squish it. You want it as small as possible. But so that I didn't have to do any like, you know, bit twiddling or word collapsing, I just said everything's a 32-bit word. So my code memory and my data memory are 32-bit word addressable. They're just arrays of integers. And so this is address 0, address 1, address 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yep. That's funny. Judge also in the Google Android uh, Oracle trial asked me the exact same question. Yeah. That was the only technical question I got the whole uh, thing. When Oracle sued uh, Google on some of these patents on the Dalvik VM, I was, uh, uh, I was asked by the judge, why does it jump by two there? That's exactly what he asked. I kind of feel bad now that I asked the same question. Oh, but he's a programmer. <laughs> yeah. The judge is a programmer, though, and he was a smart guy. Oh, a yeah, guy. and he was really smart. He was a tough son of a. Yeah. No, it was good. He, it was good. As long as you ask more later nature. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. Trying to explain uh, how a virtual machine works to the jury. Significantly more challenging than tonight. Um, OK, so here's the full instruction set. And I've only done integers. Floating point is the same, kind of. It's a, it's a little more tricky because we have to store floats where we think there might be integers and so on. But in general, we're going to be able to add and subtract and multiply. I can't even divide. That's OK. I got lazy. I can check to see if an integer is less than another integer. I can check to see if they're equal. I can jump. This literally is just like a go to. This is go to only if the top of the stack is true. This is if it's false. Push a value on the stack um, from a local variable or parameter loaded onto the stack. Can't do anything with, an op with a value until I get it on the stack. All operations happen on the stack. Now, from a global address space, I can get a value. And we'll see that these are offsets, really, not addresses. And that's a, a, a direct index into the memory. Store takes the top of the stack and sticks it in a local variable. Takes the top of the stack and sticks it in a global variable. Uh, takes the top of the stack, prints it. This throws away the top of the stack. And these are complicated, but this is going to make a function call, a return, and then halt. So believe it or not, we can do all sorts of things with that. We could even fake division, probably, somehow. If I've got subtraction, I can divide poorly. All right. So now, more specifically, getting to your, uh, this is really what it looks like. So even though I'm only using this part of it, or this part, depending if you're on Intel or uh, Motorola. Um, these are the three kinds of instructions. This is just like you know, pop and halt and print. And this is you know, iconst and uh, load and store and that kind of stuff. And this is the only the call has two operands. And so this is call, the address, and then how many arguments we're going to push, or we have pushed at that point. OK, so just to make everything easy, Everything's an array of integers. Code, data, stack, everything. You'll see in the code that's just integer, left, right, bracket. Uh, let's see. OK. And so, because I guess e even at USF, we dropped the assembly language requirement. Um, so many people haven't done assembly code in a while. Remind, let me remind you that addresses, there's nothing mysterious, right? It's just a number. So memory starts at 0 and goes up. Different kinds of computers are different differently addressable by size, but ours are integers. So if I have 1,000 words, I will have 1,000 addresses, and that's it. Okay? So pointers, just integers. All right. So again, we want to see, we want to think about this stuff, although still not you know, great. It's not a high-level language. But, so this is the assembly language of bytecode, you might say. 
but we need to actually store it and code it. Just like we encode ASCII as integers, we encode bytecode instructions as numbers. So integer constant, well, the, the bytecode for that is nine. Why? Just happens to be where I stuck it. You can make it anything you want, as long as it's unique, right? And then, so this is basically, the first word is nine, second word is one, the third one is nine, fourth one, and then the bytecode for integer add is one, arbitrarily, and print is 14. So now ultimately what we really want is an assembly, an assembler for this that will take this text and generate this in memory so that we can execute it, but we will fake that tonight. Okay, so our little machine is very, very simple. We have data memory where we're gonna store global variables. If I have space for 100, and when you launch the virtual machine, you tell me I want 100 global variable spaces. You also have code memory, and that's where the instructions are gonna sit. I could have put them together, whatever, doesn't matter. I separated it just to make it easy so that there's something called code memory. Otherwise, I have to relocate stuff. Um, and this is my fabulous universal international symbol for data goes back and forth. Um, so here's my little CPU. And inside, I have a stack. You could argue that it, it could be outside the CPU, whatever. So just uh, for my own sake, I think of the register or the stack as a stack of registers. And I've got this fetch, decode, execute cycle that is pulling stuff out of the code memory. It's decoding it and executing it, which could be writing stuff to the data memory, could be reading from the data memory, could be playing around with the stack, it could be messing with these uh, registers. So registers, you remember, are the little tiny variables that CPUs have that are on the chip. They're extremely fast to access. Um, we are not using them for data, but there are special purpose registers that all processors have that help it manage sort of where it's at. So the instruction pointer, sometimes it's called the PC, the program, or the yeah, program counter. Um, I'm very non-PC, so I can't use those letters. The um, IP points to where I am in the code memory. So it's like keeping a finger, where am I? Where am I executing? And it might be in a loop, right? It might be bouncing around like this. I might be jumping to a function and then coming back. The instruction pointer says, what am I about to execute? Or what am I currently executing? The Stack pointer says where I am in the stack. The stack pointer starts out below the stack and grows upwards. So it starts at a negative one. So to push something, I say increment the stack pointer to zero, whoop, and then I stick a value at stack of stack pointer. If I push something again, I increment the stack pointer, whoop, and I stick something at stack of stack pointer. So this will grow and fall depending on the instructions that push and pop stuff, right? Now the frame pointer, is something we're going to use for accessing the current set of locals and parameters. And so we'll get to that uh, when we do function calls, but that's a little more complicated. Okay, um, so what does a fetch look like? This is freakishly complex. Give me the opcode at the current instruction pointer. Right, very simple. It just says fetch from data memory, uh, code memory. So I literally have an array called code that represents my code memory, and I have one called data, I think, for glo or globals for that. Now, how do I decode an instruction in my virtual machine? Well, I just have a switch on the opcode. So if the opcode is nine, I know it's, what did I say that was? Integer constant. Now, I guess it's getting kind of low for some of you guys, but to execute, you'll see, like, here's the integer add. I can do it all in one line. It says, um, you evaluate the right-hand side first. Set, uh, um, so I have to have two things on top of the stack. So it says, give me the thing on top of the stack and then move the stack pointer down one. Give me the thing on top of the stack and move the stack pointer down one. So now it's empty. And then I add the result and then I increment the stack pointer whoop, back up here and then I store the result. And I'll show you in more detail later. But so this just demystifies it. It's a very simple process. And this, for those of you who have done like register transfer language stuff, um, microcode, VHDL, anything like that, you'll recognize this as sort of hardware description language stuff. So the Java code looks very much like how you would describe a processor to VHDL or something. Okay. Okay, so my goal is just to set all this up, and then we're gonna jump in the code. And uh, I haven't figured out 
what I'm going to do there. I was thinking maybe I'd build it in front of you again, um, but we'll see. Okay, uh, so here is the full sort of general algorithm for a bytecode interpreter. And this will work whether it's a stack code interpreter or a register interpreter. Um, you have a fetch. And while I still have uh, instructions or I don't have a halt, then I move to the operand and then I decode by switching on the bytecode. And then depending on which bytecode it is, I do something. And so there's the execute part. And then I move on, get the next bytecode or opcode, whatever. By the way, I should point out, where is that? I cut and paste that from my uh, book that came out a few years ago. So this is actually simpler than what I do in the book. So if you want to go a little further, you can, you can dig into this. But if you really want to get into it, then you got to start digging into, say, the Dalva VM, which is public domain, or I should say uh, open source. Um, OK. Any, any questions on that? I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, this is, yeah. So now here is the actual code that's going to execute, well, decode and execute two instructions. The branch instruction is just saying, I want to go somewhere else in the code. That's easy. I set the instruction pointer somewhere else. Now remember, the branch instruction takes an operand, and that operand sits right next to it in code memory. And so the, uh, the opcode is at the instruction pointer, and I branch to here. So then I, oh, and I, and I incremented it per the last slide here. So now it's pointing at the operand. And so I get the operand out of code memory, and then I say, hey, jump there. That's it. The way you do a jump is you move a special register in a CPU. That's just how those work. If you want to do a call or in, a, in, a, in an Intel processor or whatever, you're just manipulating the stack pointer. So if you do a jump, all you're doing is manipulating that register. Okay? Now, um, integer add. I'm not doing any type checking or anything here. I'm assuming that they're all integers. If I were in a more complicated environment, I might be, you know, for safety, checking the type. Um, or I might have type information on the stack itself. But anyway, so all I'm doing is saying, um, okay, so when you push things, right, if I have two operands, A plus B, I'm going to push A, and I'm going to push B. That means B is on top of the stack, right? The last thing you push is on top. Therefore, I'm getting the second operand first doesn't really matter because plus is commutative. But if you're doing less than, you got to get that in the right order. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So you get the second operand off first, because it's reverse order. You get the first operand. And you have to be really careful with this pre and post increment stuff. Since uh, I at least 100 years ago, I was comfortable with C. I kind of still do that. But be very careful about the order. Because this is saying get the stack pointer first and then decrement it. Okay, so then it'll uh, get the two operands. And then, of course, this is a push, so I increment the stack pointer and then set the value. So just this add. So to do integer multiply, it's the vastly complicated change to star, cut and paste. And then that will terminate the, the switch. Questions? Oh, man, maybe this is too easy. I should have added some more complicated stuff. All right. Functions. This is where it gets a little tricky. Um, and I did this literally seconds before I had to turn the machine off and come over here. So I'm sure there's an error in here somewhere. Um, all right. We want to make a function call. There's a call instruction. But we have to figure out what the operands are. So f is in some high-level programming language, but it's going to fit. That function's going to fit somewhere in memory. Call it address 95, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's going to fit somewhere. So this f will actually be 95 or something like that when it's actually sitting in code memory. And then this is telling me how many operands, uh, how many function arguments there are that I got pushed. And the reason I need that is because I'm going to have to clean up the stack when I do a return instruction. Now, in this little virtual machine thing I have set up, every call 
Every function always returns a value, even if you don't use it. And so I just say pop and throw it away. In this case, because I'm not saving it anywhere. So now when I have two arguments, uh, crap, did I mix it up? No. Now I've got two arguments to f. On the same call, I'm going to see two now. This, this g doesn't matter. I'm just, I just want you to, the only thing I care about is that you know that x and y are parameters. That's all I care about. And that z is a local. Because I have to explain these wacky numbers here. OK, so now instead of um, throwing the value away in this case, like I did there, I'm going to store it in a local variable z. So after the call, the result is on the top of the stack. So the store pops it and stores it at offset z, which in this case is going to be positive 1 from the frame pointer, which we don't know what it is yet. OK, so to make this call here, I need to get x on the stack get y on the stack. Remember, all operands, all the action happens on the stack. I push x, I push y, and I call f, saying I've got two parameters. So if I hide all this, and I hide all this, then it kind of makes sense, right? But you actually need to know what these offsets are. So here's how the call works. The call instruction actually does quite a bit of monkeying around with the stack. So the stack down here is doing whatever it wants. This is the prehistory. When I push x, it's going to go on top of the stack. I'm going to push the second argument. And so I guess I could have shifted these up here since I only have two. But I wanted to show there'd be any number of arguments here. So I'll, the code that does the invocation pushes all the arguments, because I don't know what they are as function f. And then the call instruction itself does this stuff. It says, oh, number two, let's, uh, two arguments, push that on the stack, because I need that number later. Save the current frame pointer. Save the current stack pointer. So this is like save my state. You know, this is like putting all the current state of the machine, or the CPU, um, into a safe place. Because I might have 30 of these on the stack, and I can unroll all of them and uh, recover where I was. OK, so the call does this. The caller does that. And then the actual function itself is going to allocate space for locals. But we don't have locals yet. Um, so the call instruction pushes all this crap and then resets the frame pointer after it saves it to point to it's arbitrary, but I just thought I'd point it here. So if you want to access arguments, they're down this way. Because the stack grows up, right? If you want to access locals, they're this way. Because everything is relative to the frame pointer, right? That's what local variables are. They're all on the stack. Parameters, locals, they're always on the stack. That's the only way we can get recursion, right? Did you know the first version of Fortran didn't have recursion? If, you, if, if f called like g, which called f, it would just never come back. It's awesome. So. Um, that's before they came up with this idea of a stack, right? So you push the return address. Um, oh, where's my return address? Damn it. Yeah, so ask, oh, man. See, I told you I missed, I missed one thing. All right, in your mind, everyone downshift this guy and store the return address in here. I should have looked at the code more carefully, but I was running out of time. Um, my brain was melting in the mission today. Uh, so hot. Ah, uh, crap. OK, well. We have to save the return address, otherwise we can't get back, right? So I'm saving the program counter, the instruction pointer. So I'm saving the complete state, like I said. I'm just storing the other register that I pictured um, in that block diagram I had. Um, OK, well, we'll, we'll uh, worry about the stack uh, return address later. Um, OK, so where would it point here? Uh, let's see. Uh, I can check my code. Where did I stick it? Uh, I think I pushed it. Oh, 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 the instruction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the return address. Good question. The return address is going to point whatever is pointing here. So it's an instruction. It's an instruction pointer. Yeah, it's basically saying when f does a return, where do I go back to? Right? And so that's going to be stave, saved on the stack so that when I do a return, it's going to come back here. Oddly enough, it's actually easier when you look at the code. Well, the picture is helpful as long as it's right. Um, 
And every virtual machine will do that differently. I just tried to come up with the simplest thing that would work. Code works, my diagram doesn't. Um, okay, so according to this diagram, I must, have, I must have pushed the return address here, yeah. Anyway, according to this diagram, the first local is at one, at, uh, offset one from frame pointer. So when I'm storing it, that's why we see plus one here. Now the arguments, remember I pushed the first one first and the second one next, which means it's on top of the stack, which is higher up. So that's why the first one is lower relative to the frame pointer, okay? Now in this particular case, I have an extra set of arguments in here, um, but the first, in this case, the first argument would be at minus four and the second argument would be at minus three. And so that's why the offset would be minus four, minus three, and plus one. Now a compiler would be the one generating all this. The virtual machine doesn't care. All it does is take the offset and add it to the frame pointer and assume that that's correct. Okay, so the compiler has the hard task of figuring out where it's gonna lay all this crap out and generating these offsets. But the machine doesn't do any thinking. It just takes whatever values is there and pulls it from the stack. Okay, and then to do a return some expression, you just get the expression on the stack and then use the return instruction. Now, I think that's it and we have to jump into code. Yeah, a return unrolls all this. Yeah, let's see. So the return, uh, let's see. Um, uh, I should have printed the code out so I have it fresh in my head. Okay, so the return instruction. So this has all been set up by a call. So now I've played around and I've done a bunch of stuff. I leave whatever return value on the stack that I want, such as here. So let's say there's a nine right here. And then I do a return instruction. Okay, so now it gets complicated. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this value and I'm going to store it someplace. Oh, stick that in my back pocket. And then I want to set the, str the stack pointer down to the frame pointer. So that throws away all the locals. And I'm just thinking, should I put the return address, not the stack pointer here? I'm going to look, we'll look at the code, and that will tell us exactly what has to happen. Um, let's see, because I know I need to, well, I'll forget about this one for a second. I need to restore the frame pointer, because that's going to point, I don't know, somewhere down here. That's just going to restore it, that's fine. And then I need to take the number of arguments off, because then I need to throw all this crap away. And then once all that's gone, I'm going to push the value that was here back on the stack. So the return instruction cleans off everything and leaves the result on the stack as if nothing had happened. If the stack pointer uh, was here before the call, it'll end up here after the call with a return of value on there. And if I don't want the result, I throw it away. If I do want the result, I do a store, a G store, or, or if I have a nested function call like F of G, then I leave that as an argument. So, um, believe it or not, that's the simplest version of this. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so let's make a choice here. We have, let's see, Evan, can I uh, hide this in any way or maybe just take it down there? If, if I yeah, click minimize? minimize? Okay, cool. All right, so I've got the full implementations of the simple one without functions and then the one with functions. Um, let's see. What it could do is just start a new project and build the virtual machine on the fly for you. Or um, I could walk through the, the functioning version. Um, Generally, I build things on the fly in front of people just because it's easier to not just say, here's the, it's like, if you want to learn how to, you know, 
you know, make a, bake a cake or something like that. You know, it's, it's really kind of hard to learn how to make it if somebody goes, hey, look at this awesome cake I made. Um, so maybe I'll make a new project and uh, cut and paste, kind of slowly build this up piece by piece. So you can see how it works starting from a blank screen. Okay, let's do that. Um, let's see, maybe I, I'll keep it in the same, uh, that's going to, let's see, will that work if I make a new module and then tell Git to ignore it? Eh, that'll, that'll probably work, okay. Let me make a new module. Hello. Let's make a new module. Let's call this. Let's see, uh, meet up one, create the source, sure, why not? And that should all be what we need. Okay, so now I've got another one here, and I'll make another package called VM. Uh, and files, no, 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 no. I can do git ignore, I guess. but. Uh, okay, so now I got a package. So first thing, let's do let, let's uh, let's define what our bytecode looks like before we even try to come up with a machine that can implement it, right? So I'm going to come up with a new class called bytecode. That's going to get annoying. And I don't want to use the num because I want to assign the actual values. So I'm going to do public static, final int, uh, what did I say, well, whatever, it doesn't matter, integer add, I think was our first one. I'm going to call that one. And then I could go through and do all of these, right? Um, but instead, I will cut and paste those. <coughs> so rather than do all of those manually, Here's our bytecode instructions. Okay, so this is just an enumerated type that lets me define what these actual bytecode numbers are. You know, because in reality you'd want them to be certain bit patterns, and you know, that's obviously going to be done with integers. So these are the opcodes. Doesn't say anything about the operands. These are the op opcodes. Uh, I think I can get away with the, without the rest of that stuff. Let me see, I think I can get rid of it, I can get away with all that, yes. Okay, we don't need that. All right, so let's, uh, let's come up with a test meetup one. Meet, meep, meep to up one. No, if I say this, it'll screw me later, but that's all right. No. Um, all right, we'll do the Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so we're going to we want to let's say we, let's define a program first. So we're going to do test-driven design, right? I'm going to make a test. So I said that my code memory is a bunch of integers, right? Okay, let's make some integers. Static integer. Uh, hello. There's my first program. It doesn't do much. Here's another one. Import static vm bytecode star. There's our first program. Okay, there's our first test. Now, how do we execute this virtual machine? Well, let's make an op object called vm. And I don't know what I called it, but uh, we will probably need a constructor, but let's see. Okay. Oh, what does a VM have? Uh, let's say it just has code memory at the moment. We've got code. We know we know we need a stack as well, and then we need registers, right? So simulating. Uh, simulating this. Uh, Now, where we go? 
here we go. So I need a stack, I need data memory, code memory, and I need a bunch of registers. And then we'll, we'll call this some kind of function to simulate that. Okay, so I'm gonna go back here. Let's put the data memory in there, what the hell. Okay, so I got all that stuff. Now let's define the registers. So registers are easy. That's just, I got an instruction pointer, I got a stack pointer, and I got a frame pointer. Then um, I need a constructor, and you're gonna have to pass me some code, and uh, you have to tell me the initial starting point. Uh, let's call that the uh, main. Okay, so when you wanna execute something, you create a virtual machine that has code, and you tell me where to start. Well, that's not quite right. We gotta tell, much, tell it how much memory it's gotta use. So like uh, data size, whatever. Um, and uh, so then what I'm gonna do is say, make me some data this many. Mm, that sounds good, how about if I make the stack? Um, I'll break a bunch of rules here. Uh, now, the instruction pointer we're setting in the constructor, the stack pointer, remember we want it to st start below the stack so that we push before we add. So starting at negative one means when I increment, it'll start at zero. Frame pointer, uh, we don't care what it is, the first call will set that. Okay, so that actually creates that picture that we saw. Um, now we need a function to execute it. Um, it's called CPU and it does precisely nothing. All right, so now we know how to do this. We say, give me a virtual machine, and I'm gonna pass it code. Start at address zero, because that's address zero, and then how, much, how many data elements do I need? Zero. Thank you. Okay, now, let us execute it. Copy CPU. Okay, give it the old smoke test. Nothing. That's exactly what it should do. Okay, so we have the infrastructure. We've actually simulated by, uh, we've simulated the elements within a processor. We got memory, uh, stack, and registers. And I've built my first little program that is pretty boring, but, and we have a CPU that doesn't actually execute, but that's the basic infrastructure. All right. No mysteries. No mysteries. Uh, well, let's see if we can do this on the fly. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. We have an instruction pointer, which is IP. So the first thing we need to do is say, what is my opcode? Opcode equals code of IP. So that is the fetch. Let's put that down. Okay. Does it still work? Yay. Now, I don't, it's not really a test, right, because I, I didn't check to see what it did. But, okay, so we have a fetch, and now we need an execute, uh, decode. So I'm going to say, depending on the opcode, do something. And if it's a halt, uh, do a return. Uh, let's see, uh, VM bytecode star. And uh, probably do this. Let's, once we've fetched the instruction, let's move immediately to the operand. Now, if there are no operands, that's cool because then I'm just pointing at the next instruction, right? So this actually executes the halt, which is pretty uninteresting because all it does is return, but let's run it anyway. Yay, it didn't erase the hard drive. Okay, so um, let us, let's see. The simplest program we can probably write that gives some output involves a print. So let's put a number on the stack and print it. So let's convert, where's our hello? Let's convert this to integer constant um, followed by 99. And then let's print 
and then let's halt. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? Okay, so there's a slightly more interesting program that pushes 99 on the stack and then prints. So this won't do anything, but we can run it. And let's see, now we go to our virtual machine here. Nope, oh, that's the wrong one. Stop looking. Let's go to this guy. All right, so now we have to implement the integer constant, and we have to implement the print. Now, you'll notice, of course, that it's only going to do one instruction without a loop. So let's make a loop. Uh, while something, we let's do that. And then uh, code equals code IP. Uh, let's see, OK. Uh, while, uh, that's pretty tricky then, isn't it? Uh, Let's, I'll change this then. While the opcode is less than or equal to less than the code length, and then we'll probably want to do something like this. And uh, let's see, so we get it inside. Yeah, so we gate it, so we guard it, so we don't um, check it after we've tried to fetch from it, right? We want to make sure we stay within the code memory. So this will stop either if we run out of instructions or if somebody executes halt. Now, okay. let's just do this. So this should print hi mom from our little test. Now it's doing, it's recognizing this, it's fetching and decoding, but it's not executing this because we haven't done anything. It's fetching, decoding that, and doing something stupid. Um, and it's actually executing that by exiting. OK. So we know we need, well, let's do this one at a time. OK, so how do we get something on the stack? Well, first thing, the integer constant instruction has an operand in the code memory. So we need to get it from the code memory onto the stack. So what is the value? Uh, let's call it the operand, uh, whatever. So it's on the stack somewhere, and I know it's something to do with the stack pointer. But um, <clears throat> to pop something, I take the value at the top of the stack, and then I decrement the stack pointer. Uh, yeah, grows upwards. So to push, I increment. All right, so that the, gets the value off the stack. Now I need to push something on the stack. Uh, no, that's not what I'm doing. That just uh, got the <laughs> a moron. So you guys can stop me when I'm doing something stupid. That's fine. So that was, that was the opposite. Yeah, I'm going the wrong direction. Right. You want to get something Thank you. Off the stack, but right, exactly. So uh, I want to get the operand out of the code memory. And this points at the operand. So this gets the value. And now I want to increment the stack pointer and then stick something on there. Uh, correct. See, if I don't do it at the same time, I forget the increment stuff. Um, so, although that was probably the craziest thing they allowed you to do is to have side effects like that, but whatever. Um, okay, so I have now moved to the instruction that follows the operand for the next time I come back around this loop. And I've <clears throat> pushed something on the stack by making room or by moving to the next spot in the stack and then storing the value right there. Okay, so this went from code memory to the stack. Now to go, we go the other way to print. I take something off of the stack and then I print it. So I'm gonna print V and V is now on the stack. So I get what's at the top of the stack and then I pop it by decrementing it. Does that look right? I think so. Um, Okay. Do you want to do D? Um, I do. I do, but um, Java won't let me declare it again. So it'll reuse it. It'll just assign it. It's in the same scope. If you do this, Java, uh, you could add braces, but that's an extra two characters. 
Hey, it goes faster if you don't have braces. Just kidding. <laughs> so, anybody keeping up with the code? No? All right, all right cool. Oh, I meant typing it in, but that's fine, as long as you're mentally with us. Um, or not, I get paid the same, just nothing. Um, so, all right, let's run it, let's run it. Our first interpreter. <laughs> Crazy, right? See, it's so simple, it's so simple. Um, <clears throat> now, wouldn't it be nice if we kind of knew what was going on? Let's add a trace so that we can see which instructions it's executing. Because right now it's mysterious. It gets the right answer, but we're not sure how. So let's put a little trace in here where we say, um, so we can, we can add a little Boolean. Boolean uh, trace equals, let's say true. Well, let's turn it off by default. And then in our test, before we execute, we can say trace equals true. And uh, so now, if trace is true, then let's, um, let's do it standard error. Then we want to print the address, let's say. And um, I guess we'll need that. And then let's put the bytecode, which is this opcode here. And I guess we can do a new line. Oh, I need something else. I want a comma, don't I? Yes. And I want another value. There you go. Pair programming, awesome. Has anyone managed to do pair programming here without killing their partner? Just kind of an informal software engineering. Anybody? I guess not. See? Doesn't work. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so now, check out. It said at address zero, it executed bytecode nine. At address two, it executed 14 and 16. What? That doesn't look very good. What the hell is 16? Oh. oh. Well, if I don't have you around, how do I know what it is? So we gotta make a mapping that goes from bytecode back to string, right? So, <clears throat> one way to do that is to go back to our bytecode and <clears throat> Make an array of strings that um, is the opcodes. And then we just do this. Um, the first one's invalid. And then for, is i add, i sub, i add, i sub, and so on. And then we could go in here, oh, in here, and say, <clears throat> Uh, bytecode dot opcodes. Did I make that static? I guess not. Uh, there we go. Static. Whee. Uh, opcodes. That's not very nice. Opcodes of opcode. And then that'll kind of crash because it'll be out of bounds. But um, you can see that this is getting us closer. Uh, the one thing it doesn't say though, actually, do we need to know that? Yes, the one thing it doesn't say is how many operands there are. And it'd be nice to know what those are so we could print out the operands as well, because right now we just print the opcode. So if there's zero, one, or two operands, we don't know by this number, I mean, We'd have to have another table that said, map the bytecode to how many operands. And we could do that too. But we're object-oriented programming dudes and dudettes. So let's do that by borrowing this little class here, which groups a name and the number of argument, uh, number, yeah, the number of operands. Could do that with the name too, because you can give arguments. It's yeah. true, that's true. That's true, and I could also specify the bytecode. Yeah, could do that. I got to get with the like '90s on Java. <laughs> For 
For some reason, the enums uh, in Java have always pissed me off. I don't know why. They always sound awesome. And every time I go down that path, in the end, I get pissed off and I go back to an integer. I don't know why. It works great when I'm teaching this stuff. I go like, oh, here's an enum for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But every time I use it, it for real, it doesn't do what I want. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. The same happens to me, but then somebody reduced my code and asked me, why don't you use enum? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a, uh, this is the number of um, operands. In fact, we can do a little better than n operands. And uh, <laughs> fix that. Um, operands. Okay, and so then instead of doing it this way, we will do new instruction. Um, and then how many operands, I guess, if we don't give one, that is zero. Uh, did I do that right? Number, what's wrong with that? Oh, the, there you go. And this will just be null, and so on, and so forth. Now, of course, I'm not gonna retype all that in front of you, because I don't hate you that much, but just a little bit. Uh, let's do this. I'll just cut and paste it, because that's exactly what this is, right? I'm just magically pulling that cake out of the oven as if we had baked it for 45 minutes. And I put that in my byte codes. Get rid of this crap. Okay, that's good. So that, oh, and it doesn't have call, because that's in the other branch. Um, now I go back to my virtual machine, and I've changed the name of this to instructions. Um, so this gets, Let's get the name, and then I can print the operands by if, all right, let's do this. Uh, if the number of instructions, number of operands is one, instructions number of operands is two, do that. Okay, so now we'll get rid of this. If there's an operand, we're going to do, we're going to put a space and then the operand. And that operand is at code IP plus one. And we're going to print whatever the integer value is. And if there's two of them, uh, just to be sure that we do it the right way, I'll cut and paste this. And then if there's two, we're going to put actually this. IP plus two. And oh, then to be good little programmers, let's uh, dis a symbol opcode and do a little refactoring because we always clean up, right? What's that? Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. Let's see. There we go. And then. Uh, That'll throw it on the end, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that'll probably work. Okay, so now let's run it and see what we get. Oh, much easier to read, huh? Let's move that up. Whee! So unfortunately, the, the streams aren't synchronized that way, but the 99 just happens to come out at the same time. Now, of course, it doesn't show us what the stack it looks like. To save us all a little pain, I will go grab that from this virtual machine. So you look at the bottom, and this thus dumps the instruction. Uh, oh, this, oh, these are the operand stack. Okay. Oh, it's funny. Two days later, I'm doing it totally differently. Okay. She goes, I can't remember what I had for lunch. Okay, so those are the operands, and now what we want is the stack. So this, 
One of the things that changes, and you get older when you write code, you write more comments because you can't remember literally anything. And so rather than look stupid in front of your colleagues, you put comments in your code so you can remember what you're doing. Um, okay, so, but of course I called this the stack, I guess. And uh, now this is gonna be length. Uh, am I doing this the right way? Okay, so I have an array and I wanna go from zero to the stack pointer. God only knows what the hell I was doing. Let me think instead of cut paste. Uh, so this top of the stack is valid, and so I want to get the top of the stack, whatever the value is, and oh, I know why I was doing it this way, because I was adding, um, yeah, I was uh, going to use the string print out of that to format it, ah, yeah, okay, whatever. All right, so I'm getting the value, and um, let's just do it the tricky way. Crap. Oh, you're killing me. I cry a little bit every time I have to do this in Java. Ah, uh, you. way we could just print this out when we're done. Stack. Okay, and that will automatically get the brackets and crap around it. Let's see if this does it. Of course, we're going to want a couple of tabs. Oh, uh, that's true. That's true. Uh, let's see, can we do a subarray and then, yeah. All right, well, let's just forge ahead since this will probably work. It won't be pretty like the other thing I had because I did alignment and stuff like that. But Okay, so now it's, oh, and it's doing it afterwards. Um, it's printing the stack before I execute the instruction, right? Because here I'm printing, I'm tracing. So it won't look exactly like what I've got. So let me go fix that by getting the real one. Let's see, is this going to be doing exactly what I want? Hmm. Hmm. That makes me a little nervous. Why is that? Uh... Oh, it's doing it after it's executed it. Okay, that makes more sense, actually. All right, so I'm going to do it the way I had before, which printed it nicely. So I'm not going to do the trace before. I'm going to trace after I've executed the instruction so that I can show what the uh, stack looks like after it's executed. Uh, op code. I don't really need that. Uh, hello. What the hell is going on here? OK, give me the air. Can it resolve printf? Uh, oh, disassemble is going to come back. Do, 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 do. Okay, so now we'll get the actual thingy, which comes back with a string. I shouldn't have bothered with a trace. You could trust me on the trace. <laughs> Just get rid of this whole thing. And of course, I've renamed that, yes. Uh, what else is screwed up? And one more thing. This. Okay, so all I've done is move the trace down to the bottom and cut and paste the thing that I know works. Not quite. we need that one too. While we're at it, I'll just get all of these. Let's get all this crap just for fun. 
on. So that's all just tracing stuff. It has nothing to do with the interpreter. Globals, I think I called that data. Actually, I better rename that because to make it consistent with the other code. Okay. And number of operands. Okay, now in principle, it will look right. Okay. Uh, why is it pretty data memory twice? That's going to dump after we've executed everything. Okay, now we got it. So now it's printing the stack right. Okay. Um, so we need to make a more complicated program. So the only thing left is the set of instructions. Um, let's look at loading and storing from global memory. Oh, that is an excellent question. Um, yeah, I incremented it. Uh, let's see. So what did I? Yes. What did I do here? Oh, holy crap. Got that first. Oh, and then the last one. Ah, the last instruction to execute. I got you. I got you. OK. Right before that increment. All right, and then we move these guys outside as well. Missing after I've executed the stack. Missing this guy. Good lord. All just to get this trace. That's going to be just inside the while loop. Oh, thank God. Okay. So now we have the, the trace. But it's general and it'll work for any of the instructions that we have. All right. So let's do the, um, the global stuff. So let's make a little program that stores 99 somewhere. Let's store it at address 0 in global memory. Global store uh, that 99. Let's put it at address 0. And then let's load it back in and print that. OK, so I'm taking 99, putting it on the stack. I'm storing it in address 0 in global memory. That means I need one memory location. And then I'm loading it back in, putting it on the stack, and then printing it. So now I tell it I've got to have one global data size. Here we go. Um, and let's make this one yeah, the main IP. OK. Um, now if we execute this course, it's not going to understand those instructions. So we've got to implement uh, global store, global load. So let's go jump in there real quick. All right. Global load. Global store. Let's do the store first. Okay. So the global store takes something from the top of the stack and then stores it somewhere. So let's do that first. Let's get the value. We've gotten the value off the top of the stack and popped it. And now I want to store it at an address specified in the code memory. Because the code memory has the opcode and it's got this operand, which is the address to store it at. The value it stores is from the stack. So now I've got everything I need and I can say, uh, whatever the global space is, store at that address that value that I pulled off stack. To load something from global memory, I got to go the other way. I got to get the address. It's now going to screw me up again. I got to get the address as the operand. Got to increment over that operand. 
load. So, and uh, now I get the value uh, from the stack, right? Pop it. Oh, yeah, sorry, thank you. Globals address. I get it from global memory, and now I need to stick it on the stack, which means I increment, and then I say stack at the top of the stack, store that value. I think that's right. Okay. So after we execute this, we should not only see the value 99 come out, we should also see it uh, when it prints data memory out. We should see one value in data memory of 99. Not bring the data memory, why not? Uh, let's see here. At least it printed the right thing and it executed it. Let's see here. Dump data memory. That's interesting. Somebody's calling this for sure, right? Yes. Oh, he's the halted returning path. Oh, <laughs> the halt. Damn that halt. There you go. <laughs> That'll solve that problem. Actually, that's not right. We'll get to leave that in there. So let's, uh, yeah, you could do it in a finally. Um, just get rid of the halt. We'll just, yeah, that's true. Break. Uh, no, break will break the switch. We need to break the loop. No, yeah, yeah. So that's all right. Uh, we could label it, or we could take out the hal. Uh, let's, let's break uh, the loop. <laughs> Beyond. Yeah. It's true. Loop. Okay, now let's see what we're doing here. Uh, we're index out. Let's see. So it's trying to go too far. Because we let the IP increment beyond. So we can't disassemble there, so we need a guard. is greater than or equal to code uh, length. Uh, that bugs me. Return. Uh, nothing. Okay, so now you can see at address zero in data memory we have 99. And so we got the 99 in the stack. We stored it in location zero, and that disappeared from the stack. I load zero, I get it on the stack. I print, it takes it off the stack, emits it, and then halt terminates. Okay. Um, let's look at the other instructions real quick. Um, are there any of these you want me to go over before we hit the function stuff? Let's see, it's almost eight o'clock. Okay, so we're coming up on close to an hour and a half. It's sort of a general question. But mm -hmm. Um, it's a tighter uh, code format generally if you don't have a, have a lot of addresses. Like if you just had like, you know, uh, A plus B as variables, you'd have to um, have possibly 32-bit addresses. You could use, uh, well, let's see, in that case, we could. Um, well, let me, let me think more carefully about that. So why, why don't we... Pull it directly? Well, because it can come from a lot of different places, right? So the add instruction always knows that it's coming from the stack. It doesn't need to know that it's a local or a, fl uh, a parameter or a global. You could just have a whole bunch of combinations. You could have, you could have enough combinations. But then, and different operands, right? So it's a combinatorial explosion of things. So they basically normalize it. What's that? Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, th this is definitely, I mean, basically, for efficiency, you wouldn't use a stack machine. You would use a register version of this machine where you can actually hold on to temporary values, because this is stupid, right? We're storing it, and then we've got to load it back, right. right? If we stored it in a so-called register, which is really just another memory location, right. um, it actually produces a slightly larger instruction set, but it goes faster because we can save some pushes and pops. Because the fewer instructions you have, the faster it goes. The overhead for each one of these instructions as we go through the fetch execute cycle is very high. So you want, you want the t code to be as tight as you can, but you want the fewest number of instructions because you've got that overhead on fetch, execute, decode, and all that. How about rest okay. machine cycle? Kind of. Fewest number of instructions in your program or fewest number of instructions in your instruction set? Uh, in the, the fewest number of instructions executed. For the same functionality, the fewer the instructions you interpret, the faster it'll go. So in that sense, you want really fat instructions that do more. Where does that overhead come from in number of instructions? Why is that? Uh, it comes from this little bit right here. So it's got this, this loop, right? It's got to fetch it, uh, do this switch to decode it. And remember, the bigger this switch, the more instructions you have, things like that, that are in the instruction set. If you have more instructions, physically, just in your instruction set, it can push this out of cache, maybe. Right? So the cache issues, like uh, the Dalvik VM guy, Dan Bornstein, I guess he's not here tonight, but he told me that they added a couple of machine instructions, and it pushed their VM out of the cache, and all of a sudden, the their tests and made their VM seem unbelievably slow all of a sudden. And all they did was shift something and they missed a cache line or something. So when you get really, re when you, your phone feels fast or slow based upon the VM, every single, you know, all your understanding of architecture and everything comes into play. Um, but in general, there's a lot of overhead in this loop, right? And th the loop is bad enough that people will actually do something called a, um, I guess you call it a threaded interpreter where instead of doing a break, see, remember, modern processors have this pipeline, right? So if, if you have this, uh, if you change where the program counter is, it, it throws away a lot of stuff it's already done. Because as I'm executing, I'm actually prefetching other stuff. And so it causes this pipeline bubble. So this branch, is this break is actually a branch to the bottom of the loop. And then it's a branch back to the top to execute this, come back in and jump to the right thing. So there's a lot of branching. The more branching you're going to do, slower your processor is going to go your physical processor. And so what they'll do is they'll change this break into a computed go-to. In, like in C, you can do something like uh, jump to the address associated with the next opcode, <laughs> you know, or whatever. And it'll do this funky jump directly to the next little snippet of code here. So you do everything you can to get rid of this, um, this thing. And it's all architecture related. Right, so they do that too. Exactly right. They, they order them by the frequency. They analyze the programs, and they figure out which instructions are more common. And then you make sure those are together uh, so that they're more likely to fit in the cache and together on the same cache line, maybe. And, um, and most of the time, all this will be written in machine code. Correct. Room to fast. Yeah, it's it's uh, it is definitely. You know, to get a, a virtual machine working, you can see, even though I'm fumbling around a little bit here, it's very easy. Uh, to make one go fast, it's very hard, especially if everyone's looking at your phone, going, "Man, this is slow." Um, so, and then of course, this is just the interpreter. If you want to do the real. Uh, a real virtual machine now that compiles down to machine code, you got an even harder problem. And uh, that's you know well beyond my experience. So, uh, I mean, I could do a simple one, but uh, so I mean, they spent you know maybe a billion dollars on that virtual machine for Java. So, um, yeah. So instruction set design. So for example, um, what happens a lot? Well, we we uh, use zero, one, and two a lot. You know, when you're writing code, right? 
i plus one, um, you know, set x to zero. We use those literal integers a lot. So we're doing a lot of i const and whatever. So even the Java VM does this. They make instructions called push zero. So it's not a bytecode that says push and then zero or one or two. They literally make bytecodes. So it uses eight bits instead of eight bits plus the operand. So it reduces the decode time because you don't have to fetch that in memory. And it shrinks the size of the program. Maybe then that'll all fit in cache, right? So um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot you can do to improve the performance of these VMs just by futzing with the instruction set. So, okay, so I guess there's nothing else super mysterious in this instruction set other than the call and return. Um, so these, you know, branch, as we showed earlier, is just get the address out of the code operand and set the special register IP, and then all of a sudden you're at the new location. And if you want to branch only if true, then you figure out where you're going to go. You have to get that anyway to increment beyond it. Um, and then you check the top of the stack. You pop the top of the stack and see if it's true. And I just made that one, the number one. I encoded Boolean one, uh, true as one. And then you set that. Otherwise, you just keep going. So you can see how these branches work. Um, loads, I guess these are for locals. They should have gone only in the other branch. But as I. I showed you these locals and arguments are all offsets from the frame pointer. So you get the offset from code memory, and then you get the value from the stack, not at the top, but relative to the frame pointer. And then you push that. So here's the push of something I yanked from somewhere else on the stack. So let's uh, switch branches now. And I uh, better move this module out of here. Uh, now let's move it up here. Okay. Let's see if it'll let me. Uh, oh, yeah, duh. Uh, crap. And now I'm really getting into territory I'm not good at. Get Mr. Assembly Code. Oh, you. Bastard. Is he branches ahead by one, but that's okay. Did that, did that actually switch me? Yay, it switched me. Okay. Oh, did it? <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, that's fine. Cool, thanks. Um, all right, let's figure out what call does. So there are two things, there are two operands. I'm going to get the address, comes next, that I'm going to jump to, and then I want to know how many arguments there are to the function. So the first thing I do is push, oh yeah, I wasn't pushing the stack pointer, like being an idiot, I was pushing the, the, uh, the instruction pointer. So this is instruction pointer, not stack pointer. I don't need to save the stack pointer, I'm using the damn thing. Um, this is the return address. Okay, that's what I'm pushing on there. Oop, uh, go away. Uh. Okay, so I push the number of arguments. I save the frame pointer. I store the return address. And now I set the frame pointer to point to that uh, current position that I just pushed, which will be the return address, and then I jump. Okay, so let's walk through that visually. All the arguments have been pushed, that is the assumption. So I save, I get the address and the number of arguments out of the code memory here, and then the call instruction pushes the number of arguments, saves the frame pointer, saves the return address and then sets the frame pointer to point to this, because the frame pointer somewhere else, pointing at the previous function call. And now, all of my locals are below me, uh, are above me, and my arguments are below me on the stack. So all positive one, two, three, and so on are my locals, and negative from negative three down are my arguments. What do I need the frame pointer for? That's to define a nested uh, 
functions. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd get lost. Yeah. You wouldn't know which locals you're looking at or whatever. It, it doesn't matter when you return, it tells you how much to pop off the stack. Correct. That's what, the, that's what these do. So let's look at, um, in fact, I think we can uh, do something clever. So now, um, so to return, now the stack pointer is playing around, uh, and they eventually get a return value from the function, and they leave it on the stack, and then somebody calls return. So I get that return value from the top of the stack, and now, the stack pointer was up here somewhere, and I jump over all those locals by setting the stack pointer back to where the frame pointer is. So I set the stack pointer back down here. So now I just, all of this stuff went away from here up. So the stack pointer now points down here. Remember, that's instruction pointer return address right there. And now the stack pointer is right here, and so I pop it, and that's the return address. So that's, I'm jumping back to where I want to go. And now I pop the next value off and stick that in the frame pointer because that was the saved frame pointer. And then I say, OK, pop the number of arguments that there were. And then drop the stack by that many so I go over the arguments that you originally pushed. Now that I've gotten rid of all the locals, all of my overhead in the frame activation record, and all of the arguments that were originally pushed, then I push the return value that I got originally from the top of the stack. Should where the stack is after you pop out all those arcs be where the frame pointer is pointed? Is there a redundancy? Um, no, the frame, well, the frame pointer is only used to access locals and args during the execution of the function. So once we're done and we're, in the ins we're done with the return, or we're, we're executing the return instruction, the frame pointer is no longer valid. We don't care about it. We want to set it to what it was in the caller. Say main calls f. Once we're done with f, we want to set the frame pointer back to where it was for main. Because when we go back to main, we want to access locals again. Right, right, right. So it's going to be at the top of the stack. That's right. It'll be the top of the main stack. Shall we implement factorial? I think we should. Oh, that's so exciting. So basically, when you have um, a bunch of functions calling each other, you end up with activation records with right. holes in between? Yes. And you yes. If we, have, if we have F calling G calling H, you'll have a record that looks like this for F. Well, you'll have one for main. And then you'll have one that looks like this for F. And then you'll have one above it for G. And then you'll have one above it for H. So you'll have like three of these little blue sections on the stack. And as you leave H and G and F and go back to main, all of these will pop off. And as we see this factorial function, um, you'll see the stack grow and shrink. So we'll start out with like factorial of two to see what the stack looks like. Um, OK. so. I've uh, played compiler here, and so here's the bytecode for factorial. Um, if the, since I don't have less than equal, I just have less than. This is really if n is less than or equal to 1, we know what the factorial of that is, right? It's just 1. If it's 0 or 1, factorial is 1. So this is loading the first argument. fp minus 3 is the first argument. And then I'm checking if it's less than 2 by pushing a 2 and doing less than. Now, if it's not the case that it's less than 2, I'm going to jump down to instruction 10, which is to actually compute the factorial. Otherwise, I return 1. I push a 1 and return. OK, so this is just has nothing to do with the execution of the interpreter. This is the compiler translating high-level language down into these bytecodes. So some bytecode compiler has to do this, but I did it for us. And I've listed all the addresses here. So when I say branch of false to 10, you know the 10 is right here. OK, 
So now, here's a little more complicated one. I've got to multiply n times the result of a function call. Well, what is n? Well, it's the argument to the function. So I know it's a frame point of minus 3. So I load it on the stack. So I got one operand of the multiply. Now I've got to get the second operand of the multiply. Well, how do I translate this? I've got to call a function. OK, well, what's the first argument? Minus 3. How many arguments do I have? One. So I push a 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm doing a subtraction here. So how do I call this function? Well, I've got to get its operand on the stack, its argument. So what is it? Well, it's n minus 1. So I get n on the stack. I get a 1 on the stack, and I do a subtraction. That leaves n minus 1 on the stack. Now I call function 0, which is back to you know, me recursively with one argument. The result of calling factorial, I multiply times this guy, which is still on the stack, which is the original n. And then I return that value. Freaky. Um, and then here's my main program. It starts at address 22. It says, let's compute factorial of 5. Well, let's start with 1 and see what that looks like. So I push a 1 on the stack, and I call factorial with, um, in fact, we can be clever and replace this with factorial just to make it look a little better. OK, so I'm calling the factorial function with one argument. And the result of that, I'm printing. So this is main program here, call fa print factorial of 1. See how that translates? So factorial is um, t recursive? Uh, yes. So Could be um, done as a loop, obviously. But it wouldn't be as interesting. And I couldn't demo the uh, recursion. What's that? I could. That's right. But that would be the compiler, and my brain is too slow to do that. Um, OK, so now what we want to do is execute this guy. Um, and let's just see what the stack looks like to see if it mimics this. Uh, so now we want to execute this one. OK, again, this is starting at address 22, main, and no data memory. It's all doing it on the stack. OK, we're computing factorial of 1, which should do nothing but from main jump into here and then return with 1 on the stack. How does it do that? OK, we're going to compute factorial of 1. I get 1 on the stack, which is the argument of factorial. I call factorial, which is at address 0, with one argument. OK, so the 1 on the stack. So this is the same one I got here. Now, I'm pushing the number of arguments, which is a 1. The old frame pointer is negative 1. I don't care what it was. I, I must have set it to negative 1 uh, in this version. So that's this guy. And then return address is 27. What's 27? The print after the call. That's the return address. OK, so that's the result of calling or executing the call instruction. Now notice I'm at address 0. Oh, OK. So I go to address 0, and it says load relative to the frame pointer minus 3, which is going to be 1. So it pushes this guy right here. It pushes 2. And then checks to see if it's less than. So it pops both of these off and pushes a true on there. In which case, it, this branch of false does nothing. So then it executes 1, or pushing a 1 on the stack. So all these, this branch popped that false off. Now it pushes 1 on the stack. And now it executes a return instruction. Notice what it does. It's got the return value. It's got the return address. It's got the frame pointer. And it's got the argument. And all of that crap comes off as a result of executing return. And it leaves one on the stack. Okay. And then halts. So now let's try two. And it'll do a recursive call. So we're going to do factorial of 2. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, man. OK, let's see. Um, we're calling factorial with an argument of two. So we put the argument on the stack. There's one argument. The frame pointer is some old thing. We don't care what it is. The return address is 27, this guy right here. We get inside the factorial function, and we do this load constant check thing again. Until we get to this branch, if false. Two is not less than two, so it leaves false on the stack. So branch, if false, to 10, switches to address 10 and pops the false off. Notice that it's left the frame activation record here all on the stack and the argument, I guess. So this is these three plus the single argument. OK, so now the stack is basically empty in effect for this function. So now we're starting to push stuff on the stack again. I load n twice. I do a subtraction, and then I do another call. So I load n, which we know is 2. I do it twice. And then I put a 1 on there so I can do a subtract. So I leave 1 on the stack. And now I do another call to 0. So there's my argument. There's how many arguments? 1. The frame pointer is 3. Because where I, uh, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, that's right. There's my frame pointer. My return address is 20, which is after the call. Right, so you can see how it starts to, to push. And that only does one extra call. Let's jump this up to 5. And then that'll be a value of 120 when we execute, yes. And you can see that this will get quite large. But it keeps pushing all of these frames on the stack. And so like here's the, the top of the stack is also, is always where we're doing our operand stuff. And so, uh, but the return will pop all these frames off. And, uh, you know, obviously it's tedious to go through there to make sure it works right, but um, it handles uh, recursion no problem. More questions? So, yeah. Uh, how did I build, how would I build a register machine? Ah, the trick is the registers are virtual registers, and you can have as many as you want. So they don't map directly down to machine instruction registers uh, until, of course, you're generating machine code. But so what you do is you say, okay, every function call has a thousand. 2,000, 100,000 registers, whatever, it doesn't matter. And um, registers, so let's see, I, I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but registers make it a lot easier to keep stuff around without having to do this push pop stuff. And they're not really mapped to uh, physical registers, so you don't have to worry about that part. Like the Dalvik VM is a register machine. You, um, I don't know how Dalvik does it, but um, I believe what you do is you have um, a set of registers you know you need for that function. And then you're going to call another function. So you put more registers here they're going to use for that. And then you want to get tricky, right? Because you've got to pass arguments. Where are the arguments? Well, they're, the arguments to this function are stored in registers for this function. So what you do is you overlap these things so that it magically sets the arguments of this guy with some locals of this guy. Right? So you kind of treat them like a stack and registers. So you get really fancy like that. For the VMs in my book, I just said, oh, the hell with it, copy it. So you don't have to worry about overlaying. But so again, to make it efficient, you've got to avoid all that memory copying. Um, and so they do sliding register windows. Are uh, most VMs written in lower languages? Yes. Or yeah, they're going to be C, or if you really want to go fast, you go down to machine code. C would be pretty good. I mean, because. Um, GCC now has that computed go-to, so you could avoid that whole loop. There wouldn't be any loop in your fetch, decode, execute, because at the end of every instruction, you would jump immediately to the code for the next instruction. And in fact, I, that's right, the Dalvik VM is even more sophisticated. It doesn't even want to look up the address of the next bit of code to execute the instruction. 
So let's say we know the next bytecode is like integer add. Well, you might have to look up in a table what that integer add is, right? What's the address associated with that bytecode that I need to execute, the implementation execution? They just said, you know what? Allocate a certain number of bytes to every bit of implementation code. And then we can just do a multiply or shift to jump to that code. We don't even have to look it up. I mean, crazy stuff to avoid a memory load. Because again, on a phone, you're dealing with you know, slower memory. Static RAM, uh, DRAM, uh, whatever that is. Um, yes. Uh, so, at, at the end of the day, you're going to have to leverage, when you implement the VM, you're going to have to leverage the actual physical registers. So you end up basically paginating it. All if you're going to generate code. Or, or, yeah, I mean, when you're implementing the, re the, the virtual machine and you're doing a machine code, you're going to have to think about the registers. Uh, if you're generating code from the bytecode, you're going to have to think about registers, all, uh, real registers. So it's like just a simplification of you know, a higher level. That's right. It's a high, it's a high level physical machine. Yeah. And I think Sun actually built a Java VM into a chip Yeah, the, the, a while back. And I think Azul does that now, right? Yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. And then I think Azul does that in hardware, the Java bytecodes in VM in, uh, in hardware now too, or at least something close to the bytecodes. Um, I think Azul does super high performance stuff. Um, but it turns out that, you know, the minute you implement a chip, Intel comes out with a faster chip that with machine code generation is actually faster than your chip. You know, you're like, ah, oh, crap. Yeah. Or you just let Intel keep spending billions on chips, and you work on compile te compiler technology, which is what Sun did eventually. It's pretty hard to, you know, beat somebody else pouring that much money into into processors, right? And that's why Apple eventually, I think, switched over to Intel, right? I mean, they're building their own chips. I mean, it's just like you're going to slowly lose against Intel on that. Um, more questions on the VM. Yeah, it's pretty simple, right? Is, is, is it simpler than you thought it is? It would be? I mean, that, that's exactly, I mean, Python, Ruby, they all work that way. Ruby was actually something a little slower first. It was a tree-based interpreter, and uh, it speeded up greatly when it went to a bytecode interpreter. What are the trade-offs between tree and bytecode? Uh -huh. So, first of all, what is a tree-based interpreter? So when we parse stuff, ooh, I get to show off my plugin. Check this out. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Blah 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 blah. Let's see if I launch this. I think I have the latest version on here. Okay, so let's say you want to build an interpreter for a high-level language, right? Well, so I said you had to have a compiler down to bytecodes. Well, you don't necessarily have to. You can actually have something that um, doesn't go to bytecodes, but uses an, in, uh, an internal representation that's a tree representing the input. So for example, here's a Java grammar I have sitting in IntelliJ. And let's say um, I want to create, uh, let's see, I'm going to order these by, I want to test my rule called um, array initializer. Oh, that didn't look right. But make this a little bigger. Okay, so what does an array look like in Java, an array initializer? I don't know, whatever. It looks like this kind of crap, right? So this tree here is a representation of how this grammar matched this input. So the first thing that the parser does, now I can show off my plugin. I added these little cool, oh man, did I, didn't, I didn't pull that in. I didn't pull it all in, but that's all right. Um, so this shows you the token types with each token uh, that you're, you're looking at here. But then what this is, unfortunately, uh, I don't have the latest goodies on here. Um, what this particularly is, is represented here. So this 
you know, one, three, five, that's a literal, which is the primary, which is an expression as part of this initializer. So what you could do, you could just stop right here, right? This is the parse tree that represents this input. What you could do is make a tree walker that simply walked this tree or a simpler version of this tree, if you wanted, to execute the code. And that saves you having to go down to byte codes, so you can just immediately start, and once you've parsed it, you start executing. You don't have to translate to bytecode first and then start to interpret and so on. So it seems easier at first, but I think it's actually harder just to write the interpreter itself when you're doing all this tree walking. Because you're doing recursion to walk this tree, right? And now imagine trying to debug a recursive program implemented with your tree-based interpreter, which has recursion. So you're debugging a recursive program that's simulating a recursive program. And it just really starts to hurt your mind. Um, so when you unravel it down into this little bytecode stream, you're serializing it, right? You're taking this tree and you're going, I const one, I const three, I const five. You're serializing it. Um, so in the end, it's faster. Because um, remember, you're going to have to keep touching this whole tree, which might not fit in memory, or, you know, a cache. Um, I find it harder to understand. So wait a second, it's faster to do the tree based uh, You'll get, the, the latency is faster. It'll, it'll start to interpret right away okay. by a tiny bit. Um, but it's harder to implement the interpreter itself, I feel. And it appears to be slower because you've got more work to do. Right, you've got to walk a tree versus take, like how do you go to the next instruction in a bytecode interpreter? I plus plus. That's one clock cycle. Whereas with a tree, I've got to go, oh, call my visitor function that goes over here, or it's a lot more overhead. Unless you create a function that's changing that. Yeah, uh, it turns out everyone seems to find it faster to go to the stack machines. I don't know anybody that's made it go super fast, so. Well, you'd probably use a different pattern. So there's tra uh, translation from one high-level language to another, or you're saying from a high level to a lower level like C, or you're saying, yeah. okay, I mean, so. I, I'm going to see lower level. Yes. Relatively. Yes. So what you could do, instead of generating bytecodes, is generate C code that had a bunch of function calls in it. So imagine that's also another kind of threaded interpreter. See all these. Uh, are these guys. See all these little things right here? I can pull these into functions. Like let's say I, I, I broke this out into a function called load. Now, I, instead of making bytecodes you know, called load or whatever, I could actually generate C code, which is a series of function calls that look like this, load, g load, and so on. So there would be no like switch. It would just be calling a bunch of functions in a row. So the output of, so instead of generating these bytecodes, so let's look at this simple thing up here. Instead of this, you would see C code that looked like this. Uh, I const one, I const two, I add, I print, or uh, print, and halt. So you could generate C code that looked like that, and then you would compile this stuff and then execute it. And that could go faster, right? Because the compiler, the C compiler could look at that and go, hey, I can inline all that crap. And then that would go pretty fast. But you know, it could get bulky, right? Because right? this is how many bytes of code memory in C. Well, I don't know. But I do know that it's only eight bytes in bytecode memory. So if you cared about memory size, then doing it this way may not be so good. But you could use a pattern like this. Yeah, I've seen that before. And a clever C compiler could make that go very fast. Because you're getting rid of all these branches, right? Branches suck. You don't want branches. So 
when you're doing all this switch and jumping around and all, I mean, it's super inefficient. Oh, by the way, who, who, who did the C interpreter here? Somebody did, oh, you did, yeah. So he translated the Java version to the C and the exact same code just went twice as fast. Of course, it's hard to say, right, because, you know, it was legit and, you know, fully warmed up and all that kind of stuff, but um, probably if you, uh, if you didn't give it a chance to warm up, then yeah, the C is going to crush it. So uh, let's see. So there's lots of different kinds of interpreters, but it all comes down to somehow you got to represent the program and uh, do a simulation or compile it down to C or whatever. So and then and you also have to have C compiler on your system. Yeah. <sighs> well, yeah. Don't build a tree one. <laughs> don't build a tree-based one. That basically what I've. It grows more complex to be easy in the beginning, but it'll just get really, really bad. Yeah. And you know, there's an example. I mean, I have an example of a tree based interpreter in the language implementation patterns book if you want it. If you want it. Um, and um, it, yeah, my experience is it just so, it gets so complicated so fast. So I would, that's the biggest gotcha. Bytecode stuff is really easy. The other thing I found, like I had. Uh, Tim, were you in my class when we did the bytecode interpreter? Yeah, the small or, I mean the small talk, yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing I noticed is that if you're implementing a complicated language, like small talk that has closures and all kinds of wacky stuff, um, you can make a bytecode that says, do all this really complicated stuff. <laughs> it's just one instruction. Whereas if you're generating C, you've got to generate, or machine code, you've got a lot of stuff to generate to, man to manage stuff. So interpreters are often the fastest, easiest way to get an interpreter together. I mean, so the, my grad students built a compiler and interpreter for Smalltalk, a complete one, right? Uh, in you know, in one, one semester, and half a semester, really. So it's, it's pretty easy to do that. Whereas if you had to generate C to do that, you're like, OK, oh, man, I got all kinds of stuff to do. Because we, well, in that case, we borrowed like Java's garbage collector and stuff. So, yeah. anything else? Groovy. Uh, mm -hmm. Like one question related to the C code generation yep. part. So, uh, in, in in real life implementations, whoever has implemented a C code generator, they use like uh, string templates. Oh, they should. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I've seen everything from print statements to all kinds of weird stuff. But yeah, you should use some kind of template engine to generate structured text, um, unless it's really simple. Um, yeah, I've taken to building up an internal model that represents the output. That's a hierarchy of model objects. And then the name of the model object maps to the name of a template. And then I have a generic walker that walks my model tree, instantiates templates for each object, and passes the object into the template, which says how to render it. So it's pretty slick. And then I just point to the top of my model hierarchy, and I say, render to text. And it gives me a big string of the whole program. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely. And so Antler's generated with string template um, all, all the recent versions. and. Um, it's very useful for that. You wouldn't use it for websites anymore because it's all client side, but you know. Okay, well, I'll hang around a little bit uh, if you guys want to chit chat. Uh, thanks for coming, guys.